uh, LinuxConf. Uh, in this session, we have Maintainers Don't Scale, brought to us by Daniel Vetter, who's uh, from Intel, where he works on the kernel graphics. Uh, if I could ask you to please welcome Daniel to the stage. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, uh, I'm going to talk about maintainers specifically, kind of from the kernel maintainer perspective. Uh, I, I maintain the, the Intel graphics stack, or I have for, for yeah, five years now. Since, since about three, four years to get in a team together with Yanni Nicola, which, which really works very really well. And uh, I've been doing quite a bit of, of graphics core maintainership and, and stuff there too over the past three years or so. And, and for statistics, uh, I think on the last Linux Foundation report on the entire quantity or quality scale of how many patches and maintainer merged. I think I, I ended up at spot, top spot five or six or something. So uh, I'm pretty busy and of course I'm going to talk about how this maintainer thing doesn't really scale. So of course your reaction is, uh, you get stupid and burned out. And, uh, so I'm, I'm, I don't really want to talk about burnout. I think it, it is a, a pretty hot topic in, in our um, in our culture, in, in our kind of programmers. There's a super pervasive cult of busyness. If, if you're not always overwhelmed with work and, and, and overloaded, uh, you probably like slacking or not worth it or not Competence, or, or that, that's a lot of the implication, and that obviously does not uh, not help at all if you're a maintainer. And uh, I, uh, over the past few years, I definitely had some hard times and so, some challenges. But on the other hand, when I when I started with maintainership five years ago, it was about two, three people full time working on that driver, me included, and now it's about 20 people full time. And I would say any time you, you kind of in a leader role of a team that grows this, this much, it, it's tough. Uh, and I don't think it's like burnout or anything. It's like something specifically that's, that's worse with being a maintainer or not. But, but yeah, definitely know the progressions and the early signs so you know when you need to step out and, and take care of yourself. And I just want to reference here a great talk from uh, Jacob. He's, he's the... Oh, I think was now the the, the Django um, maintainer for life. Uh, Title: What part of for life don't you understand? When he talks about all kind of getting burned out, there's lots of great references, and 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 how how he reworked uh, how things work so that he could step down a bit. I know there's somehow an empty slide. I don't know how that helped. Anyway, so the, the other bit uh, is I've, I've done this talk. When I submitted this talk like half a year ago, uh, I had a bit of a different idea of what I want to talk about. And I ended up doing the talk I submitted at Kernel Recipes uh, in Autumn. And uh, LWN has, ha, has some really great coverage of, of, of that topic. There's also the slides and everything on it. Uh, there was a, 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 an hour-long discussion at, at Kernel Summit about the entire topic, which kind of has all the details and stuff. And I figure for, for LCI here, uh, I, I want to focus less on the technical details that we'll be exactly doing, uh, because there's lots of other projects who I think are much more experienced, who can give you a greater story there. Uh, so I just want to kind of summarize so we're all on the same page. Uh, what kind of the traditional um, model of maintainership is. Uh, we'll be doing since about a year uh, differently in graphics and, and then kind of elaborate on all the, the, the reasons behind it and why it, it kind of for us in graphics, uh, the traditional kernel maintainer process doesn't work so well. So l let's look at how contributions land in the, in the main tree that Linus Torbots maintains. And the first step is you, you, you hack on your code and you create a bunch of commits and stuff. And then you send them to a mailing list with git send email. 
and there's discussions and reviews and testing maybe or, or an back shedding and whatever else happens there. Eventually, the, your, your patch is ready and a maintainer comes around and kind of takes you, you, your email and throws it at the git, uh, git apply inbox, which then recreates uh, the git commit out of it. And uh, this, th th this is roughly what happens to about 80% of all patches. So 80% of the patches, the person who commits it to a tree is not the person who wrote the patch, uh, but, but kind of just a maintainer. Uh, and then there's, there's uh, pull requests. So the maintainer eventually sends a pull request to Linus Torvalds, or there's sometimes in, in graphics, uh, they fail is kind of the intermediate level. Uh, and, and sometimes I think there's even two intermediate maintainers, so it, it blocks up the, the hierarchy as, uh, as a pull request and eventually then lands in, in Linux towards three uh, and I guess released. And yeah, the, the other 20% of patches, they still go through the mailing list, but they get applied by the people directly who wrote them, so they're essentially the patches that maintainers wrote. So. Overall, we, we, we have a bit of cane tooling uh, compared to kind of just GitHub and stuff and everyone else does. And, and it's also a, a fairly uh, steep hierarchy with 80% with of the people are not having direct access to any kind of tray and, and just 20% of the people kind of being the maintainers more in control. They, they still send, send out pull requests. So for, for a bunch of kind of reasons, we were a bit unhappy with, with that one and a half years ago with Intel. And um, the primary reason was that kind of everyone was pinging the maintainer despite that we had a, a nice review process going on with, with P review. And instead of working together with the reviewer, I need them just, oh, Yanni is my co-maintainer, just applying the patch at the end uh, when, it, when it's all done. Uh, we always got like direct pings to maintainers, so there was kind of a, a, a bit of bottleneck. And, and what we've done is, is what lots of other projects do. And we essentially just gave commit rights to our Intel graphics tree to all the regular contributors. So na now uh, I've crunched with the numbers. There's 70% uh, of all the patches get applied by the people who wrote them. So directly, and just 30% are, are still kind of going through some indirection. But mostly, uh, for most of these patches, it's not like the maintainer, like me, me or Yanni, uh, but it's, it's their reviewer. So uh, on the kind of author reviewer pair, one of them almost always has, has commit rights. Uh, there's still two maintainers, but what the maintainers are left doing with is essentially just to to interface with the wider world. So we send out pull requests, we do cross uh, maintainer, uh, maintainer synchronization. And like I said, I don't want to really go into all the details of what we've done with CI and stuff and review. Uh, uh, just kind of shout out to, to another community, to the Rust community, and, and Emily Dunham has, has done a great talk last year here at LCA uh, about how, how they run the show. Uh, call, uh, titled Life is Better with Rust Community Automation. So if you want to know how to do this properly, that's what I'd refer to because we're still learning. We're still trying to figure out how to do this. But uh, what we're experts on, I'd say, is we, we kind of have the fairly unique perspective of both the traditional kernel model and kind of the, the much more uh, participatory uh, uh, committer model that, that we're now using. And so I'd like to look at that. Now, before the, the big rant starts, uh, uh, I, I, would highlight, I would really like to highlight a, a, a bunch of things that the kernel community has created, which I think had a, a really great influence on, on the wider, or at least as I see it, on, on the wider community. And the highlight is definitely Git, Git 1. Git was created by kernel developers for the kernel developers. Uh, it has a bit the side benefit that kernel people not just gave the wider community a great tool, but also a somewhat not so great user interface. But can't help it all. 
uh, I, I think that that's really uh, it works extremely well. It's it it it, it scales to gigantic projects, and I think it makes collaboration a lot lot easier and a lot more powerful. Another thing I, I just kind of observed in, in the graphics community, they, they have kernel drivers and then user space drivers and X service and so on, is, is commit messages. We, uh, for unfortunate reasons, I need to dig around in Git history quite a bit. And kind of the further away you are from the kernel and the, the, the longer you dig into, into the back history, the worse the commit messages get. <laughs> And, and I think that this is another case where, where, uh, where the, the Linux community, uh, I, I guess just for the tradition of submitting everything to mailing list and always having like an email that explains what it's supposed to do and then get happened and that email just got applied as commit message, is, is a really great example of, of how useful, great, extensive history so when like in two weeks when you don't know what you've typed anymore you can go uh, go back and, and see why code is like it is and the, the final highlight I think is the git bisecting stuff which is a lot older than than git at least I remember that kernel bisecting has been a thing since patches a anyway so so that's that's the git stuff the not so good stuff, I think, is, is the maintainer model itself. And, and there, uh, let's look a bit at how maintainers are made. And I would say almost always it's by accident. You start doing something, and uh, like you wrote the driver, you did a little library or whatever. I mean, even I set off the kernel. And uh, then you put it on the internet or get immersed or whatever, and suddenly other people find it useful. And, Congrats, now you're the maintainer. And uh, the thing is, is uh, when, when your piece of code gets like popular, and there's more contributions, or maybe you need to do other things in your life or your job, uh, sooner or later you get a bit overloaded. It, it kind of just happens. And I mean, it's nice if you're overloaded, it means the stuff you're doing is, is kind of suggestful. But the downside, and I think this is where kind of the kernel community in, in many areas goes a bit wrong, is, is like, how does this handle? Because you have one maintainer, and instead of kind of adding more maintainers and have a group and sharing the load a bit, what, what almost always happens in the kernel is that you get a second level of maintainers. So people start helping out. And the way to help out in kind of the, the the, the kernel uh, hierarchy of, of pull requests is you create your own tray and you start sending pull requests. And so a, a new maintainer uh, is, uh, spot is created, but it's again just a single person. So the cycle repeats. And, and the other bit is also there's people who, um, who do small things all over the tray. For example, they, they, they work for a platform and then here's a little bit of driver in this subsystem, here's another small driver. So they kind of accumulate lots of small bits of pieces of driver code and, and parts of the kernel. And, and what you end up with is, is lots of overloaded maintainers, always just a single person, oh, almost always just a single person. There's very few uh, areas in the kernel which, which are run by, by group maintainership. Uh, and, and it's always, fairly often it's, it's, it's the similar group of people, but it's always just one person who's kind of responsible for this. And of course the thing that comes up is like the, the bus factor, what's when the proverbial bus hits some one of these maintainers and you can't get stuff done. The, the thing is in the kernel, because there's so many small trays, and a lot of things kind of need two, three subsystems, it's kind of interaction. You don't need a bus. Like people go on vacations, people have like product crunches and, and SOCs that happens like twice a year. Uh, people are just like maybe they have kids and just no time, <laughs> or, or they they're kind of just floating out of that area. Anyway, if you if you as soon as you cross like two th three things, you pretty much guarantee that one of your maintainers uh, is just not there. And you can't get your stuff in. There's, there's examples of drivers where you have like a, a, a hundred line driver and it takes six months to get that thing merged. And uh, 
I think that that rather steep hierarchy, which by default just has single maintainers, is is not working really well on that factor. Um, the other bit that steep hierarchy is kind of not good at is making sure that they, they take into account the needs of, of, of everyone. So from the beginning, I said that 20% of the patches are merged by maintainers directly. Roughly 80% is everyone else. So with this hierarchy, uh, the question is, does it take into account the needs of kind of the 80% to make sure uh, they don't have a horrible life and can't get their code in or... And so I went looking around for uh, are, are there checks and balances in that hierarchy because if you open up the history book, anytime someone starts a, a, a hierarchy with, with a dictator at the top, sooner or later, despite best intention, it kind of goes sideways. And, uh, yeah, spoiler, there's not a whole lot. Oh, no, I didn't find any. Uh, the first thing is, is review. So, uh, in, in theory, every kernel patch, every pa patch, every commit that lands in the kernel is supposed to review it. And for 80% of all patches that get merged by maintainers but authored by someone else, it's kind of the maintainer's duty to ensure that the patch is reasonable. How he does that, or she, um, it's, it's kind of open. But, Let's look at the, the patches, the 20% patches uh, written by kernel maintainers. And uh, the question I had there is, do kernel maintainers bother with subjecting themselves to peer review? Because if they merge their own patches and then send the pull request, kind of the next maintainer up is supposed to double check that and make sure it's, it's, it's all reasonable. So all the patches do get some kind of review, but my question is, is there like peer review? Is there some kind of control of like a group of people to make sure their maintainer also uh, follows the standards they, they, they want to set out? And um, I, I've hacked together a quick dirty script and run some numbers and uh, in, in the intergraphics, this is just the last year. Uh, just focusing on, on patches merged by the same people as authored, so kind of maintainer patches. And in infographics, uh, yeah, a few percent of the patches don't have a review, and that's probably my script getting it wrong. Because if I remember correctly, we had one patch, or maybe two, of uh, I think one and a half thousand last year, that there, there's someone kind of mixed up the process a bit. Uh, for the wider graphics core, it's, it's about the same story. So, uh, uh, it works there well. Of course, you can say uh, the Intel graphics team is really big and the graphics core is a bunch of people from a bunch of vendors, so yeah, it's easy to do pay review. But even if you include all the drivers, and there's lots of drivers, but it's just one maintainer and just one person who understands the hardware or cares about it, uh, only 25% of the patches merged by maintainers kind of don't have some kind of recorded formal review. Now, if you exclude graphics and look at everything else in the kernel, only 20%, 25% uh, of, of the maintainer patches have some review recorded. And, well, if you add graphics, it's 33. <laughs> so, so that's why it's everything else. <laughs> so, uh, the, the, and the thing is, if you, if you don't always force yourself as a maintainer to only merge patches that are reviewed. It's easy, well, this is just a trivial one. I don't need a review for this. Well, this is just a small thing. And, and the people notice that, and then they, yeah, maintainers are kind of special, or, and the other bit, in my experience, is if your review process is kind of broken, if it doesn't move forward, if there's endless amounts of bike shedding, if you subject yourself as a maintainer to that, you're gonna fix it. But, uh, I mean, kind of peer review, this is not the only way uh, to kind of make sure the hierarchy is, is kept in, in check. And uh, this is other places, like at work, you generally can't, like, elect your manager, or students can generally not elect their teachers and professors. And 
the usual way to kind of remedy this a little bit at least is, is you, do, uh, you do service, an anonymous service, to kind of just feel the pulse of, of your students or your teams or, or kind of your wider contribution uh, base. And yeah, there's none of that in the learners kernel. So this, this uh, it's kind of the other way around. At Kernel Summit, the one feedback session is called, is Linus happy? So not whether the like 10,000 contributors are, are doing fine, but the top. Um, can we do the discussion? Yeah, so I know this is a highly opinionated talk. It's not like the technical talk. So we're going we're gonna to do the opinions in the hallway track. So this kind of, that thing also doesn't really exist. And another thing that, that kind of doesn't exist either is, uh, and it, it's become pretty popular hot topic over, uh, over the past few years, is, is code of conflicts. Like, is, is there kind of some, some board or somewhat separate body uh, that has the power to, to enforce some standards? And, uh, yeah, it's called code of conflict, and at least my personal opinion is that the TAP does not have the enforcing power. So I would say uh, a kind of a, a, a control from, from that direction uh, doesn't exist either. And so, so what does that leave us all with? Essentially, if, if, if you're in a subsystem and you're really unhappy with how it's run, how the maintainer does this stuff. Uh, you, the only option you really have is, is, is to start a revolution. And, and the trouble with revolutions is they, they tend to end in tears and they're not going to be pretty and they tend to be drawn out long struggles. And most people just decide, well, I'm not going to bother. I'm not going to like go through this trouble and try to improve things. So they either just walk away or kind of quietly try to not annoy people too much. And I think that's not, not really good. Because uh, things change and, and we need to adopt the process. And I think the, the overall the kernel community from, from what I'm saying is, is not kind of taking, taking that into account. Um, Another thing that, that we kind of realized a lot when we gave people the, the case to the kingdom, or well, come on, right, is, is the entire di difference of kind of how you do review. We always have like review, a peer review and in inter graphics. Uh, but like I said at the beginning, it, it was somehow people always thought because the maintainers are special, they need to haggle with them to get their patches in. And we, we really kind of failed at, at making a, a peer review mesh work. And uh, I think, in a way, it's just a really small symbolic step of giving people commit rights. But uh, trusting people or, or giving people that trust kind of convinces them that, yes, really, they, in that small part, they are in charge of the situation. They need to work together directly. And, and um, kind of looking at what happened over the one, past one and a half years in, in the graphics group at Intel is really uh, trusting people to just do the right thing with a lot of checks through tooling and CI and all that uh, results in lot, uh, much better collaboration, uh, much better uh, kind of information sharing, people really collaborating directly and kind of in a mesh. And so I'd say in overall, a lot happier team and, and, and quite a bit uh, a stronger, stronger team that, that gets much, that, that gets more work done instead of uh, focusing it on, on kernels, uh, the, sorry, on, on, on the maintainer. And uh, 
it, it, it also, in, in, in the case of review, does make the maintainer not kind of a special person, which I think is, is sometimes unfortunate when, uh, when maintainer review amounts to rewriting patches and stuff, which, uh, yeah, in my experience on DRI Devil, uh, on, on the DRM core, where I sometimes try to, to trick students and, and other part-time hobbyists into contributing a bit more, if you rewrite their entire patch, or uh, they they might not be too happy about that, and kind of there's a pave is if you if you kind of a reviewer on equal level, they they feel much more welcome, and you can pretty successfully trick them into refactoring your parts of your subsystem, uh, and and so th this kind of the the entire, uh, with, with kind of the, the strict hierarchy, the, the downside of having fixed roles. So people can own more of the maintainer responsibility, so it's, it's harder to, to mentor them and, and maybe get my replacement in case I get bored with, with the duties. And it's also kind of hard for me because, uh, or it was hard for me since I was kind of in that fixed role and that was my job, and, and doing random other bits and pieces for fun, or because I thought it was interesting, uh, was quite a, a lot of a lot harder, and, and I think results in in, uh, in people feeling stuck. At least that, that's that, that was the case for me. So uh, myself, I'm massively more happy about how things are running because I have lots more freedom, but. Yeah, kind of every week doing something, something slightly different. This time I, I'm mentoring someone on something specific. Then I, I go write some documentation or uh, I, 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 I code some new feature. And, and kind of not having or having a lot fewer stock roles and kind of that rock star uh, approach to here's the great people and here's the people who just do the grunt work and who cares about them. Uh, help, helps a lot in, in building good teams and, and, and better communities. Now, th this is kind of the the rant part, and uh, I think the the big problem is that um, yeah, if you become maintainer, it's kind of by accident, and and and, and everyone who's is. And if you become a maintainer and the thing is uh, successful, the trouble is th there's not a whole lot of, of kind of blueprints and resources about what you're supposed to do and how should you run the show. And I get a bit the feeling, and definitely for my case, everyone everyone learns this by uh, hopefully not too badly burning out and hopefully not burning too many bridges to other people. And kind of tying in, and this is purely accidentally, uh, with, with yesterday's keynote, I think will be will we do need is um, yeah some guidelines about maintainers about uh, what do you what what do you do you need to do to to kind of make a good job and have a healthy growing community that will still be around when you're gone because sooner or later you get bored doesn't pay do something else. And so the, the final parts of my, of my talk, I, I'd like to close with uh, some ideas for uh, getting to its, uh, yeah, I just called it the maintainer's manifest. Uh, yeah, what, if you are a maintainer, what is this job all about? And uh, I'd say the first item is about the people, not the code. Because if the people disappear, your code is not terribly useful anymore. I mean, it's a software. It bit rots ridiculously fast if you like look away for two seconds. So, yeah, that, that's that's really the first thing. Uh, I think maintainer is as soon as you have like two, three contributors, it's it's a it's a people leading role, and much less. Kind of a technical. Of course, there's there's big technicals, technical components, and and that ties in with recognize the people, 
we did the work. So you contributors, you co-maintainers who's behind the scene doing all the cool things. Uh, I've, in that area, I've done stuff like write, write blog posts, highlighting what people have been doing. And the other part here about just uh, recognizing and it's about the people uh, is, is trusting them. Because if, if you kind of uh, wait until you give people uh, the keys and trust them to be maintainer until they've proven that they are, it takes like years. And, and that's, if you have a fast growing community, that's just too slow. Or in kind of that silly driver example, it takes six months to get a small, tiny driver in. And so in, in a way, you need to trust the people a bit more than they trust themselves, because otherwise they never have a chance to grow. Now, it, it's kind of the same thing like if you give uh, the car keys to your kids for the first time. There's a, 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 a non-zero chance they're going to horribly break it. And the same thing ha happens if, if <laughs> If, uh, if you trust people and give them commitments and say, you can do this, every once in a while someone is going to horribly screw it up and you need to be able to handle that. And uh, Git revert is pretty cheap insurance. And if you can combine it with CI so that you don't even need insurance, I think you're doing a pretty good job. Um, the next item is uh, recognize your power. Uh, I think there's this, this kind of a common, or not common, but fairly often heard theme of maintainers complaining that they can't force people to do things or, or they're kind of in a weak position. And my experience is you're not, especially in a, in, a, in a successful project like the Linux kernel. As a maintainer, you have pretty sizable amounts of power and I would say every few months or so, I have a project manager screaming at me because I exercise that power. So it's there, recognize it. And, and kind of the, the next thing, I'll share your power. I, I would say if, if you're a maintainer and there's at least one regular contributor, go, go to a group maintainership model. And, uh, Also, if maybe even more extreme, and, and just say all, all the regular uh, experienced contributors should have commit rights, to, so that you don't exclude them from from being in control, being in charge, and, and feeling like they they own the stuff they're doing. And and the other flip side is, uh, kind of don't don't play power games hiding behind technical review. I do feel sometimes that review is just a, 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 a kind of demonstration of I can block your patch because I can, but here's the technical excuse for it. And, and so, yeah, recognize that you do have power. Try to, to exercise it carefully and, and share it as, as widely as, 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 is, as is reasonable and makes sense so that you have a, like a real, a real team, real community. Um, the, the next one is, is accept your limits. And, and that's, the maintainer role changes. If you're a maintainer and you have you know, like the old ball contribution, that's a completely different job from you the maintainer and there's 20 full-time contributors. And maybe it's just not the job you want, the role you want. So allow other people to step in and recognize when they do that work. Uh, so, and uh, most important, do all that before you burn out and not after. And I think re related to kind of accepting your limits is also, if you, if you don't like doing something as a maintainer, I don't know, maybe hurting CI or trolling bugs or uh, mentoring people or what, whatever it is, don't, don't kind of walk around all the time and, and, and calling that useless or not important. Because then you kind of create a negative space where no one dares to even step in and fill that role. 
And kind of as, as, as overall uh, or final thought is uh, we, we have kind of, or this, this kind of this, this maintainer role of, of being a benevolent dictator for life. So, so one part is the entire for life kind of sounds more like mandatory sentencing than, <laughs> than a, an honorable voluntary position that, that you, you get. Uh, but, but also the dictator part, I think a, a much better way to look at this, uh, the maintainer role is to see it as a steward role. There's people going in and out, but you've kind of been around for a long time. You know some of the dark caves in your castle. And uh, I mean, that doesn't mean at all you don't have power or influence. I just think looking at the maintainer role more as a stewardship and not as a lordship uh, is, is for me and, and for the people in the graphics community, I'd say, uh, the, the right way or the, the better way to look at things and make sure uh, uh, you do build a community that's good for everyone and that lets people get stuff done. And yeah, I mean, in the end, more people means uh, more people can use it and I would say the goal is still worth domination, so uh, let's make it happen. Um, kind of for closing thoughts, I, I typed all that up in, in, in a text with a bunch of uh, references to, to the talks and stuff. I'll tweet and block that later on. And with that, I think perfect timing for a few questions. Thanks a lot. Uh, just a reminder that you need to phrase your questions as a question. <laughs> so, <clears throat> let me say, I agree with almost everything you said, except for the one thing that uh, no uh, anonymous feedback. And I, the question is, is that based on your experience or is, it, is that based on any research of, of, uh, of any kind, like when you can say that, yeah, people don't get that anonymous feedback, that the other maintainers don't get it from anyone? Um, so, I don't know why exactly, and I have no idea how widespread it is, but somehow I attracted the few people from, who also work in other subsystems, who uh, discussed with me in private the, the troubles they have with, with their maintainers. And uh, yeah, from, from kind of these stories and, 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 and that people share, uh, I would say they, they have a hard time placing the, the, the criticism in, in a useful way. And I do think, and, and honestly, it's not even my idea. So this, this, this idea of having some formalized anonymous feedback was brought up by one of, one of these people at Chalwef, uh, that kind of providing anonymous feedback from maintainers to figure out who, which maintainers do a great job, which maintainers cause troubles in their subsystem, would probably help in, in getting their concerns uh, addressed. So th that's kind of why I, I brought this angle in. The word formalized was missing from, from what you said because this was like, this sounded like no at all, right? Well, I mean, just sending an anonymous email is like, I get them all the time, I delete them because there's just assholes on the internet. <laughs> That's a real thing. <laughs> yeah, so, so this, I do think it only works if you have some structure so that you know this feedback is actually by the people who do contribute to your subsystem or a reasonable assurance that it's not just, yeah, assholes from the internet. Hi, um, I'm an ARM platform co-maintainer uh, with two other people. I've been working on changing my little portion of Linux kernel uh, hierarchy from being a sort of no go away to a yes and model of accepting patches. But I was wondering sort of in dealing with the 
negativity of the LKML world. Do you have any thoughts on how specifically to start introducing code of conducts into even a small domain um, so that we can start working on the attitude and environment of our LKML interactions? Um, I think on the, on the topic of code of conduct, the, uh, I, I see them as you codify the current expectations. So the, the first step is changing the expectations. And when you, when you have like a subsystem or community that like has agreement that they want to be respectful to each another and, and that I guess you can just implement a code of conduct. It's a bit of a question of how you, you execute it as in uh, who's going to enforce it and do you have the power over like your IRC channels and mailing lists to actually enforce it? Because if you can't enforce it, it peer pressure is, is like the code of conduct you have already. If you, if you can't enforce it, it's not all that useful. Um, I, I guess your other thing was about like how, how can we make review and feedback more constructive? And uh, my, my, my thoughts on that is that we need to try as hard as possible to have much more automation and CI on that. So the tricky question of is this correct? can be assessed by computers who generally don't scream around. And then review can really concentrate on stuff like the overall design or kind of the long-term vision or where you're going to go to. And, and also just information sharing. That, that's, I think, is really an underappreciated part of review, that when you start out with review, you have maybe one person who perhaps understands the code. And when you're done with read, you hopefully have two people who really get it. And, and kind of shifting the focus and goal of review away from the nitty gritty details to kind of more sharing information and making sure we're overall consistent would, would help a lot in, in making it uh, more useful, more constructive. So that's, that's kind of the two areas, I'd say, for you. Um. So when there's a single maintainer and that maintainer steps down, it's a very solid barrier. Or when they start to neglect a project, it's obvious that that's neglecting for someone else to set up, step up or appeal to on high. In a co-maintainership model, do you have any thoughts on uh, what happens when someone does start to step away but not necessarily completely and maybe it is time that you know, they are no longer a co-maintainer? How that may work or interactions or... Um, so I can't tell you about how to best handle or how we handle co-maintainers stepping away. Are we, and so, so maybe for clarity, are, are you talking about the maintainers, kind of the public thing, or just committers in overall? overall? Yeah. So, for, for committers overall, uh, honestly, we just haven't figured it out, which is why I didn't spend too much time on it. And the, there's other people who can do it. So, we, we, we in the intergraphics group, we are in the process of figuring out how we add committers who be, become more regular and experienced senior people. Uh, uh, and yeah, flip side is also how, how when should we remove them? Uh, I don't know yet what the answer is. It's probably something. For, for uh, min, kind of the more public side maintainers interacting, uh, for, for adding them, it's, it's pretty gradual. So we, uh, over the last few months, we started implementing this model for the DRM core with uh, three people and kind of slowly getting them up to speed. It, it just takes time and mentoring. And I, I would say, except when there's a massive clash where someone just starts to fight and be horrible. Uh, yeah, phasing out might be as, as it's, it's probably even best if you do it gradually so that they can hand off their experience and uh, expertise to the next set of people. If, if you have like a subsystem that's dying, I have no idea. Mine's growing like crazy. <laughs> uh, I guess we're at. 
So that's us done for time. It's lunch, so if everybody could uh, thank Daniel, that'd be wonderful. Thanks a lot for listening.